So Rosh Hashanah is, is the day of kingship, the day of coronation. As David mentioned before, our liturgy is filled with God as king over and over and over again. It is, it's, a, it's a concept that is in our prayers every day throughout the year, but on Rosh Hashanah, it, is dom it dominates our prayers. There are even words that say God throughout the year that are changed to king just for Rosh Hashanah because we relate to God as king. So what does that mean? We often throw terms around, and we have to understand that all of us as religious people in our own religions, we throw terms around that we say all the time, and we can sometimes hide behind them, and we don't really know how to define them that well. Oh God, oh God, the kingdom of God, God being king, God will be king. So what does that mean to me? What is that, how is that different from saying God is my God? What does kingdom mean? So since Rosh Hashanah is the day of coronation, the day of kingship, and it's so dominated by this concept, I think it best to explore this concept through the one biblical commandment, the only biblical commandment that relates to this day, which is the blowing of the shofar. It's what the day is most famous for, and rightly so. It is the biblical fulfillment of, of Leviticus 23. I'll just read those verses. Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, although it's the beginning of the year, we count the years from this month, but we count the months from the exodus from Egypt. So the first month, it's kind of, just to confuse you, the first month is the middle of the year. Okay. Um, the first day of the seventh month, you shall have a Sabbath, meaning a day of, of no work. And now here is the phrase. It's a very strange phrase. In Hebrew, zichron trua, which literally means memory chauffeur blowing, or memory of chauffeur blowing. Very strange phrase. And that defines the day. It is a day of, of resting from work, like all the festivals. And then it says those two words, zichron, which means memory of, and trua, which means the blast of a chauffeur. A holy convocation. All work you shall not do, and you should bring a, a burnt offering uh, to God, like every other holiday. So the only, as opposed to, you know, Passover, we talk about the matzah, and we talk about this, and, and then we have Feast of Tabernacles, we're building huts, and we're, and we're, having, we're carrying around the four species. There's all sorts of laws in, in, that tell us what each day is about. And all we get for Rosh Hashanah is these two words, zichron trua, remembrance of shofar. So what does this mean? So just to make things a little more confusing or to add to the question we're trying to solve about Rush, the identity of Rosh Hashanah and how it is really about the coronation of God the King, about relating to the concept of God's kingdom. So consider this more of a question than an answer. In the 10th century, there was a, a great Jewish theologian, a great scholar, Rabbi Sa'adja Gaon, who listed, and these are printed in many, many of our prayer books for, Russia, for the high holidays. Uh, this is listed, or kids will be taught this in school. He listed 10 meanings behind the shofar blowing. I'm going to read them to you. We'll come back to them at the end. He says, we, we blow the shofar because trumpets are blown when a king is coronated. So it's the coronation of the creator of the world. And we blow the shofar because that sound of the shofar is a, is a sound that, that stirs our emotions and it, and it, it penetrates and it's very, it, it, uh, it wakes us up and we're supposed to repent. So it's the alarm 
arousing us to repentance. And we blow the shofar because in Exodus, at the revelation at Sinai, where the Ten Commandments were spoken by God, it says that there was a sound of the shofar. So it reminds us of, of the Ten Commandments. And the shofar was often blown in the days of the prophets also to, uh, to arouse the people and to rebuke them. So it reminds us of all the rebukes by all of the prophets. And the shofar sounds also sound like crying. The longer one is more of a long wail. And <laughs> the, middle the, the middle blasts that are shorter. <laughs> and therefore, it's supposed to sound like crying and arouse us to, to, to crying, to tears. And also, it's a ram's horn, and a ram was, was, is what was brought instead of Isaac when, when Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. And Isaac was a willing sacrifice. In his place was a ram's horn that was caught in the thicket by its horns. So that horn reminds us of the, of the willingness to, sell, to, to sacrifice of Isaac. And he says, uh, number seven, he says, the shofar is a very powerful sound. Like in the same way that thunder kind of shakes us and gives us a sense of awe. So the shofar sounds like power. Reminds us of the power of God. It's judgment day. It says in a court, in the king's court, the shofar would be, uh, a, a trumpet would be blown when a verdict is going to be issued. That's number eight. Number nine, it says in the jubilee year, a shofar would be blown. It says in the, uh, it says in, in the Torah that a shofar would be blown at the, at the jubilee year in order to announce that all of the effects of the Jubilee, land going back to its original uh, inherit its, its original owners and slaves going free, that the freedom would be declared through the, the blowing of a shofar. And finally, and finally he says that the blowing of the shofar reminds us of the great shofar that will be blown when the Messiah comes. Lovely. It's great to have 10 meanings behind something, but it kind of leaves it difficult to define what it is. Well, it's coronation and repentance and the Ten Commandments and the, and the, and the sacrifice of Isaac and, and, and the end of days, it's, you know, all that. So what does all this mean? So to understand this better, I'd like to take you to a passage in the book of Numbers, which is not about Rosh Hashanah at all. If you have a Bible on your phone or you happen to have one in your pocket, you could take a look, but you don't need one for this. Numbers chapter 9. Numbers chapter 9 is not about a shofar. It's about the trumpets, the silver trumpets that were made by Moses. God tells him to make trumpets. In temple times, they were blown in tandem with the shofar, by the way. When they would blow the shofar in the temple, it was a shofar and the trumpets together, and then the trumpets would stop and the shofar would continue. That's how they blew the shofar in the temple, by the way. But when he, when he tells him to make the trumpets, he tells him as follows. The Lord spoke to Moshe saying, make these two trumpets of silver, a whole piece shall you make them. You shall use them for calling the community and for journeying of the camps. Okay? When they blow them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves at the door of the tent of meeting. If they blow only one of them, then the princes and the heads of the thousands of Israel shall gather themselves. And then it says, when you blow an alarm, then the camps shall begin to travel. The camps on the east shall travel. When you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps shall lie on the south side. Shall, uh, the camps on the south side shall travel. Then you'll blow an alarm for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered, you shall blow, but you shall not blow an alarm. Okay, I have to interrupt myself and tell you what's lost in translation. And I went to Bible Gateway, 
and looked at like, where you have all the translations. If you look up these verses in translation and read a whole bunch of them, you'll, once you start seeing a passage that has a lot of different translations, you know you've got to slam on the brakes, call someone who speaks Hebrew, find out what's going on. There are two words being used here for sounding a shofar. They have no etymological relationship to each other at all. They're two completely different verbs. In the English, one has been translated here as blowing the shofar, and the other one has been called sounding an alarm, or, or blowing, blowing the trumpet or sounding an alarm. It's the same instrument. There's only one way to play it. You can't blow a trumpet and then make a sound with it by doing something else to it. But there's two different verbs. One of the verbs is tikia. That's the one they're translating as blow. And the other one is tirua, which means to sound an alarm. And throughout this passage, it mentions what you do tikia for and what you do tirua for. And what's the difference between blowing it and sounding an alarm? When I blow it, I just blow it. And when I sound an alarm, I like, I blow it and I go, ah! Like, how do I blow it any differently? <laughs> so to make a long story short in this passage, the term tikia, which means a long blast, I saw, I think, one of the translations in Bible Gateway actually had tikia as a long blast and teruah as short blasts. Obviously taking from the Jewish tradition of what those words mean and how we, how we play them out. When everyone is supposed to gather, you blow a long blast. When the people are supposed to get moving, it's the shorter blasts. And at the end, in the very final verses, we, if I jump ahead to verse seven, you know, I'll jump ahead to verse seven. When you gather everyone together, long blast and no short blasts. And when you go to war to the enemy who attacks you, short blasts. Next verse, and on your happy holidays, on the days of joy and on your festivals, long blasts. Didn't catch anything? Gathering together, happy holidays, long blasts. War, being on the move, short blasts. And when it's time for a long blast, no short blast. And on all the holidays, a long blast, a tekia. And what is Rosh Hashanah called in Leviticus 23? Teruah, the short blasts. Now we see something interesting. Wait a second. All holidays had trumpets blown long blasts. So now when I look at Leviticus 23 and it tells me on, on this one festival, there's one festival where you're blowing a lot of short blasts. You're remembering the short blasts. Okay, what does this mean? It's very cryptic. The word tikiah, the word for long blast, is from the root taka, or takua, which can mean firmly implanted, it can mean penetrating, but it really implies something that is firm. If something is takua, it is firm in place. The word tirua comes from the word roa, which you guys might recognize from the word ra, which means evil. But raua in Hebrew, which is more connected to this word, means shaky or broken up. When you gather together, when it's a happy time, everything is fixed, everything is firm, everything is solid. When it's time for war, when it's time to be on the move, things are broken up. But on all the festivals, we're supposed to blow long blasts. And on Rosh Hashanah, we're also supposed to have remembrance of short blasts. And that's the definition of the day. Everything else about it is the same of all the festivals. No work and bringing an offering. The only thing unique about it is this remembrance of teruah, which means shorter blasts. The way we do it, and if you've ever heard a shofar being blown, it's a long blast, 
And then the broken up blasts. Long blast, broken up blast, long blast. Think about that image now. Isn't that our lives? When we look into the, you know, before anything happens, we look into the future of what we're planning. We've got a plan. Things are laid out in front of us. And then in the present, <laughs> things are falling apart and things aren't exactly as we wanted them to and, and there's confusion. And then when it's all said and done, when we look back, everything makes sense. In our own private lives, we have this experience all the time. We're going through some turbulent time and then only later, maybe even years later, we look back and it makes sense to us. Or God's plan. God has a plan. Before everything was laid out. And at the end, everything's going to be just fine. And in the middle, it's all broken up. Those blasts, do, 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 is the story of history. It's the story from the beginning of creation to the end of time. And when that verse says that there will be a shofar blast blown at the end of days, there will be a great shofar blown, you familiar with the verse? The word is tekiah, because that's, Everything is fine. Everything is fixed. Everything is straight. It's in the middle that it's all broken up. So what are we doing on Rosh Hashanah? On festivals, we're supposed to be happy and everything's supposed to be good and settled. But no. This is the day to remember the broken up blast. To bring that into focus. That's why we call it Judgment Day, an honest assessment of where we are in this process. Because we live in that middle. We live in the broken blasts. We're on the move. We're battling. We live in the broken blasts. So it's a day to zichron, a day to be conscious of memory, a day to be, a day to be conscious of the broken blasts. What needs to be fixed? What's not working right in the world? Where are things that need to be put back together so that I can get to the great tikiyah, the great straight blast at the end. Where are we in the big story? So Rabbi Sadja Gon tells us, you know what the shofar is about? It's not 10 different meanings, folks. It's about God the creator. It's about Sinai. It's about the end of days and everything in between. Those 10 meanings are all one meaning. And it's about where you fit in and your repentance. And it's about, and it's about self-sacrifice, which is which the whole process can't proceed without it. All the different meanings that are in there, they're all the, the same meaning. And that, my friends, is kingdom. That is kingdom. In our verses in the liturgy for Rosh Hashanah that David was talking about, I'm going to elaborate on that now. I'm not going to leave you. When David mentioned before that the Rosh Hashanah liturgy suddenly is about the world, there's no way to overstate that fact. It is so grandiosely about the world and so not about the Jewish people that if you read through our liturgy for Rosh Hashanah, you bear, the Jewish people are almost an afterthought. It's the only time where instead of talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as our fathers, we also talk about Noah and Adam. It's the only day of the year we do that. Noah is suddenly a player in our liturgy because we all descend from him. And so is Adam. They get mentioned as people who God made a covenant with, and usually we talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's much more local. It's a universal day. In, our, in the liturgy, this is the, the special paragraphs that are added in for Rosh Hashanah. Place fear of you, God, on all of your works, and awe of you on everything you created, and everything should fear you, and all created people should bow down to you, and everyone should be bound up together in one unit to do your will. 
jumping ahead a, a couple paragraphs just to give you samplings. God, become, be king over everything you created. Over and over again in this liturgy, it's about everybody, about the whole world. That's what Rosh Hashanah is about. A king, the term king, is all, very often in scripture associated with the word kavod, which means honor. In Psalm 24 that David mentioned before, it kept talking about who's the king of honor? Who is the king of glory? The king of glory, the king of glory. Very, and this is very common, that the term melech, king, is associated with glory. Because glory means there's people who are aware. If I do something great and nobody knows about it, there's no glory. Glory means people are aware of greatness. Aware of greatness, that's glory. So God could rule us, and if we are not aware of him, then he's, you know, he's behind the scenes ruling us, but he's not our king. We're not his subjects. He's king when we're aware of him, when there's glory. In Psalm 24, and, and David read Psalm 24 before. Psalm 24 is, a, is inserted into the liturgy for Rosh Hashanah in very prominent places, and in a few places. It pops up a couple times. But it was really singled out as the Psalm of the day for Rosh Hashanah. We have Psalms of the day for every day of the week that we say. Um, and like, I guess the most famous of them is actually called the Psalm of the day for the Sabbath, Psalm 92. There's Psalms of the day, and, and holidays also, according to some traditions, have special psalms. Well, Psalm 24 is the psalm of the day for Rosh Hashanah. Psalm 24 really tells us how this process works. And it doesn't mention kingship until near the end. As David read it before, the earth belongs to God, right? Everyone who lives in it. He set it up. I'm paraphrasing, but I'm going verse by verse. Who gets to go up on the mountain of God? One who is, has clean hands, pure heart, hasn't done anything false, doesn't swear in vain, deceitfully. He's the, that's a person who gets the blessing from God. And so far, the entire psalm has been written in the singular. Who, singular, gets to go to the mountain of God? Who? Oh, a person who's honest and not deceitful recipe for God's blessing. And then the psalm takes a major turn. And it says, this is a generation of those who seek him, plural. This is a generation. There's no such thing as the kingdom of God for an individual. Yes, the individual has to make the decision to turn towards the mountain of God and might even have to be motivated by getting God's blessing. But after that verse is mentioned, it says, this is not about individuals. This is a generational thing. And then it moves into this end that sounds very repetitious. But folks, bear with me. You'll never see these verses again the same way. I'm confident. I'm sure. Listen carefully. Lift up. Your heads, O gates, and doorways of the world, of eternity, be raised up, and let the king of glory enter. Who's the king of glory? God, mighty, and powerful, the God of war. And then it sounds like it's repeating. Lift up your heads, O gates, and doorways of the world, Raise up, not be raised up, raise up, and the king of glory will come. Who's the king of glory? We just asked that before, and we were told it was the god of war. Now we're told something else. Adonai Tzibaot, the Lord of hosts, is the king of glory. Selah, which is another way of saying period. Adonai Tzibaot. So here's what these verses are. We'll work backwards. Adonai Tzvaot. The only name 
in the Bible that is ever put together with God as king is Adonai. And occasionally, Tzvaot. The other names of God, Elohim, Shaddai, all the other names are never put together with the word Melech, king. From the very first time that God is called a king, which is in the splitting at the, at the, in the Song of the Sea, David quoted the verse before, Adonai, Mloch, Lolamad, first time God is called king. It's Adonai, the four letter name of God, the Tetragrammaton, which is translated in all the Christian Bibles as Lord, but whatever. It's fine. It's a translation of the Jewish euphemism, Adonai. But the four letter name of God does not mean Lord. It's a very strange word. We should do a separate talk just on this. Maybe the Bible Lands Museum. We'll do a talk on the names of God, maybe. It'll be fun. We'll do a whole bunch of them. But that, name of, that four letter name of God, those of you who know what it looks like, you can picture it. If not, don't worry, I'll share an idea with you. What it is, actually, as a word, including the, the vowels that are under it, which we don't say, we never read it as a word, it's actually quite simple. The first letter, the yud at the beginning of it, indicates the verb to be in the future tense, ye. When you have a, 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 that letter at the front of a Hebrew root, it usually is casting it in the, in the future tense. The o sound in the middle, v, ov, in the middle, that middle letter, vav, indicates present tense. The word hove is indicated by that word, by that letter. The a sound at the end, Hebrew verbs generally, if, uh, if they're present tense or, or future tense, will have an e at the end of them. And if an e verb is cast into the past tense, it'll end with a. The beginning of that word, it's the verb to be. When you, if you were to say it, which I'm not going to do, we don't say that word as it's written. If I was going to say it, what I would be doing is in the first syllable, I would be saying the word will be. But then in the middle syllable, I would change to be saying the word now. And then as I finished it, I'd be saying the word was. That's actually what it is, simply as a word. Meaning as I would say the word, and you all know the three syllables, don't say them please. Those three syllables, the first one is actually the beginning of the word to be. The middle one is actually the middle syllable, uh, the, the, the first syllable of the word is, and the last and the end of it is the syllable for the end of the word was. So you're saying this impossible conjugation of a word that you're starting out saying in the future tense, then saying it in the present tense, and then saying it in the past tense. Does that sound backward to you? <laughs> it's not. Every moment in time exists first in the future tense, then in the present tense, and then in the past tense. This evening tonight, yesterday was in the future tense, right? Now it's present. Tomorrow it'll be past. Every moment that God creates, every, every, all of our lives, before we were born, we existed in the future. Now we exist in the present. After we're gone, we will be in the past. Every moment in time goes through this process. That's what the name of God actually is. It's all of existence and all time, and it's causative. I'm not going to give you a grammar lesson and explain why. So the cause of all creation of all of it. This is the only name ever put together with God as king. Adonai yimloch le'olam v'ed. V'haya Adonai le'melech ha'kolars. And God, the Lord, will be king over all the earth. Ba'yomahu on that day, his name, he will be one, and his name will be one. His name will be one. Because past, present, and future, and all the different things that happen, and the, and, and the plan at the beginning, and the broken notes in the, at the, in the middle, and then the way it's supposed to turn out, all seem very disparate and broken up to us. But at the end, his name will be one. It'll all make, it'll all, we'll see it all, it'll all make sense. When God says to Moses, when Moses says, I seek your face, I want to know your face, God says, I can't show you my face, but I'll pass by you, and you can see my back. He meant you only understand me in retrospect. You can see my back. You can see God from the back. When we get to the end of the story and we look back, we will see it. God's name will be one. That is the kingdom of God. And on Rosh Hashanah, on Rosh Hashanah, when we blow those notes of the shofar, we are in that first blast. We're talking about the original plan. When everything was in that yuh, when everything was in that original form of what it was supposed to be, it was perfect. There was a plan of perfection. And then in the middle, everything gets broken up. And it's confusing. We don't understand what's going on around us. And there's a lot of crying. There's a lot of tears and a lot of suffering. But crying is also a sign that you get it. People who are in denial don't cry. Crying means you understand. 
but it's bad. So you cry. That's the middle. And then at the end, there's going to be that great straight note again. We contemplate this entire story. The chauffeur blasts are actually, in a strange way, the name of God. They're that future, present, past. They are the name of God. And now I want to bring you to that last line again. Raise up and open up the gates of, of, of eternity and let the king of, of glory come in. Who is it? Adonai Tzivaot. What does Tzivaot mean? Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts. That's a nice word. It sounds very biblical. Lord of hosts. Okay, let's translate the word. Tzava. People live in Israel. What does the word Tzava mean? Army. Tzava means armies. An army is an interesting thing. First of all, this, this is one of, the, one of a couple names of God that is only stated in the plural. Armies. Lord of hosts. An army is made up of human beings. Lots and lots of them. In order for an army to function, they have to really understand that it's not about them. That's what happens when you go into the army. The first work in the army of turning someone into a soldier is breaking down their sense of individuality, turning them into a unit that works in the army. So why not just create a bunch of robots? Well, robots are less adaptable than human beings, at least for the time. A human being can, uh, can adjust to changing situations. We need people, people who submit to a higher will and a higher plan. That's what an army is made up of. Lots and lots of individuals who see themselves as part of a collective that has a collective mission and a collective goal. That's what an army is. And that they're willing to sacrifice for it. So where's the kingdom of God seen? In Adonai Tzvaot. When we understand that there's a big picture, that it's all one. In the end of the day, we're going to understand that all of this stuff, the past, present, and future, all together, was all one utterance of God. It's all God's plan. And that we are soldiers in an army. We are submitting to that plan, to that will, and we're embracing the fact that we are part of a big team. We're part of an army. We're not individuals in this. There is no individual reward mentioned in the Torah. The few places where reward is mentioned, it's mentioned for the collective. This is my take home message for you. There's a lot of people in the world, I'm not saying this, oh, you're Christians. A lot of Jews too, trust me. Lots, probably the majority. A lot of people in the world who see their religious life as about them. Like the first half of that Psalm, oh, if I ascend to the mountain, if I'm clean and I'm, and I'm honest and I don't do anything deceitfully, I'll get my blessings from God. And then the psalm says, this is a generational matter. You're part of a collective. And that's the only way the kingdom of glory enters into the earth, is the collective. So the first verse says, who is the king of glory? There's a lot of war, a lot of struggle. Next stage, that we understand that he's the Lord of hosts, that he was directing it all along. So it's stage one and stage two. Yes, God acts in history, and at times it's, it's, it's war. But that's not the final line. The final line is that we'll recognize that Adonai Tzvaot, that all of eternity, all of time, the broken up blasts in the middle were part of the process, and we're in that process. So my take home message to you is, is to see religious life as about a collective experience, as about a universal experience that we're all fighting a battle together. The people in this room understand that better than, you know, when I travel around to the States, I often meet, meet Christians who, who don't have as much interaction with Jesus as, as you guys do, as most of you do, all of you. And to sensitize them to the fact that we're fighting the same battles. Forces in the world that hate Christianity pretty much hate Judaism. Forces, I mean, that's a negative way to put it. We're fighting the same battle. We, we have the same definition of right and wrong, of good and evil. And we have to have the same definition of what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is that everyone recognizes the sovereignty of God willingly and sees themselves as part of that collective entity that all experiences God together, serving God shoulder to shoulder. So that's my message. To, to see religion, to see Torah, to see God's work on this earth as a collective experience where we're responsible for the entire earth together 
And that is what the shofar is all about. And that is what the kingdom is all about. In the song, in the, in the Shema song that the Portnoy brothers wrote and sang amazingly tonight, it was incredible. Like, I've heard it a whole bunch of times. And this was just like, um, you guys were a big part of that. Surly was telling me before, she was like, whoa, like the singing. The opening words in that song that we sing are the words that we say before we say Shema. El Melech Ne'eman. God is a, is, a, is a king who's faithful. Meaning, he's a king, and we know that that, it's not going to end with broken blasts. We know there's going to be that great tekiah, that great long blast at the end. He's faithful. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen his way. We can rely on God. And then, we say, and then right after we say that, we say, after we say that God's a faithful king, it's nice for him to be faithful. We're not going to sit back and wait for him. Listen up. Shema. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. In the end of the day, if he's our God, the goal is to bring about that oneness, to bring about that awareness by everyone that everything, everything is part of God's plan. And we stand before him, Private Willicki reporting for duty, ready to do whatever the king in his host, in his army, demands of me. Repentance, the mitzvot of the Torah, recognizing him as creator. All the things in that list, self-sacrifice, freedom for the oppressed, all of the things in that list. That's the kingdom of God. That's Rosh Hashanah. And that's Zichron Trua. We're supposed to remind ourselves as we, we take an assessment of the world, that's the judgment day, say, where are we? Are we conscious? Are, Zichron, are we conscious of the broken blasts? Are we conscious of what needs to be fixed? Have a great year. Everyone, please rise. And I'll also say to you just one short thought before David blows the shofar. I would recommend you close your eyes so that this is a purely auditory experience. And I say that because of a thought that I had as a child over and over again every year. Every year as a child I thought this and I still think it. When we blow the shofar, when we listen to the shofar, and that is the commandment, not to blow it, to listen to it. Even the blower is fulfilling it by hearing it. We have to hear the shofar. This will wake us up. When we hear the shofar, we are hearing the exact same sound that everyone who's ever heard a shofar has, has heard. There are very few experiences we can have today that we know are precisely, exactly what people a thousand years ago and two thousand years ago and three thousand years ago experienced. But the sound of human breath passing through a ram's horn has not changed. When I was a kid, when the shofar would be blown, I'd close my eyes and I would imagine myself as a Jew from some other time and place in history, hearing this sound, knowing that it's the exact same sound. So there's a, there's a connection that we have with everyone who's ever heard this sound when we hear it.